We're starting a new series. I don't know how long it'll be, but the title of it is Truth, Lord. And then the subtitle, because I like those, is Humility to Receive. Humility to Receive. And we're going to go to Matthew chapter 15. We'll actually end up looking at two different accounts of the same incident in two different gospels, Matthew and Mark. And I want to compare them and just start this out this morning uh, by looking at some faith in humility in the Syrophoenician woman and then applying that to our own lives. So Matthew chapter 15, verse number 27, this is the King James Version. If you have a different version, it might say something else, but in prayer when I was praying about this, this is the phrase that I heard, and I guess I heard it in the King James. But it says this, the Syrophoenician woman actually said to Jesus, and she said, truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Now, in the New King James, it says this, and she said, yes, Lord. There's a lot of power in just those two words, okay? And so we want to look at how this applies to us today. And it goes on to say, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their, from their master's table. Um, in, these chapters found, uh, in these chapters found in Matthew and Mark concerning the Syrophoenician woman, and the healing of her daughter, we find faith and humility working together in submission to truth, producing miraculous results. So we find faith and humility working together in submission to truth, producing miraculous results. The Lord tells us that we are to speak the truth in love. This does not mean that truth will always make us feel comfortable. How many have noticed that? Truth has the ability to set us free, as we have seen in John chapter 8, verse 32. Jesus said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? Make you free. But notice, it's the truth you know that makes you free. It's not just truth. You have to know it. It has to be a part of you. In these two accounts of the Syrophoenician woman, we find her navigating through submitting to truth while remaining in faith and humility. We see what the truth is like in Jeremiah 23, 29. The Lord says this, Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? Now, which of those analogies sounds the most comfortable? <laughs> Lord, not the fire today. I'll take the hammer. Well, not the hammer. I'll, I'll take the fire. Well, how many have had this reality that truth can be this way? Yeah. Amen? Truth brings freedom, but sometimes it feels like fire burning or a hammer breaking. Because truth comes like a fire and a hammer, there is always the temptation, now listen closely, because of the enemy and the nature of our flesh to respond in fear and pride, which always leads to increased bondage. Proverbs shows us this about concerning pride. Proverbs, you can jot these down, you don't have to turn to them, but you can jot them down. Proverbs 11, 2, when pride comes, then comes pride. Shame. Shame is bondage. Did you know that? But with the humble is wisdom. Proverbs 13.10 says, By pride comes nothing but strife. How many have ever been in strife before? It, <laughs> it is total bondage. How free do you feel in strife? Have you ever walked into a house where people have been fighting and it's like they stopped right before you got there? You can feel it. You can almost, you can, it's almost like you can take a piece of it out. But the well-advised, but with the well-advised is wisdom. Proverbs 16, 18. Watch this. And I think I'll probably end on this one. Pride goes before what? A fall. That word, it, uh, it also is destruction. And then it says this, and a haughty spirit before a fall. So we're going to apply 
these thoughts that we just went over to this, these two accounts in the Gospels, okay, in regards to uh, the Syrophoenician woman. And you see, if you can, as we're going, allow the Holy Spirit to show you where you could be offended at truth. And I'm going to prove to you this morning that it will actually stop deliverance if you're offended by truth. Amen? I'm going to prove it to you from the Word here, or from the Lord's truth. It won't be my own. So let me give you a little historical background. Remember, you're in Matthew 15, and you can find verse 21. And if you want to put your finger over in Mark 7, that's where the other account is. But let me, let me read a little background to you concerning these two uh, accounts in the Gospels. Jesus, in, in these, if you read in the uh, previous verses in chapter 15 in Matthew or chapter 6 and chapter 7 in Mark, you'll see that this is what was taking place. But it says, Jesus had left Jewish cities to escape the scribes and Pharisees. Did you know Jesus did that? Do you know that's actually part of Psalms 91 sometimes? You know, sometimes people think uh, Psalms 91 is just like angels get around you and like there's this, oh, and the enemy can't see you anymore and there's, you know, you know this very spectacular thing. But there are many times where Paul and, and, the, uh, and the other apostles in the book of Acts and then also Jesus in the Gospels where it says he hid himself. He hid himself. Why? Why didn't he just walk through the midst of them? Because the Lord told him, his father told him to what? Go hide. Amen? Now, some, some people have taken that verse too far, and they're hermits. But anyway, <laughs> this word to escape or to go or went out from in the Greek carries the idea of a tactical move in order to get away from an enemy. This was a strategic move by Jesus. He was not just wandering around. This makes sense concerning the previous parts of these chapters. This miracle for the Syrophoenician woman came about because Jesus was hiding. The history of the area where this woman was raised connects back to heavy worship of Baal and of Jezebel. How many remember the story about Jezebel and Elijah and all that good stuff? This could explain why she ended up with a daughter who was severely demon-possessed. Okay, Matthew chapter 15, verse 21. I'm going to read through this, then I'll read through Mark 7, and then we'll go back over it. Then Jesus went out from there and departed from the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a, a, a woman of Canaan came from the region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely, what? Demon possessed. She ain't just demon possessed. She's what? Now, how does that... I mean, it must have been bad. It must have been bad. Severely... But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. Get her away, Jesus. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and to throw it to the little dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Mark chapter 7, verse number 24. From there he arose. This is the same account, just different authors. From there he arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and wanted no one to what? But I thought he loved people. (laughs) I love throwing these little thoughts in because people are like, he'll never leave me nor forsake me unless he's hiding in a house. (laughs) Is Jesus, in this case, is Jesus expressing a lack of love because he's trying to hide? No. But we need to think about these things. For a woman whose young daughter, and and then it says, but he could not be hidden. Verse 25, for a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. The woman was Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. She's persistent. 
But Jesus said to her, let the little children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to what? The little dogs. And she answered and said to him, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, first, for this saying, go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone out and her daughter lying in bed. So this is what I want to do this morning. We're going to combine these two accounts and learn from this woman's faith and humility to receive. As we apply these truths to our lives, we will receive our breakthroughs from the Lord. Come on, truth applied always produces a blessing. What did James say? He said the doer of the word would be blessed. Amen. So we see Matthew 15, 21 and Mark 7, 24 record the same thing. We'll just read over these. If you're taking notes, you can mark those two passages down and then any comment I make under them, you can just add that to your notes if you'd like to look at later. But Matthew 15, 21 says this, Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Matthew 7, or Mark 7, 24 says, From there he arose and he went out to the region of Tyre and Sidon and he entered a house and wanted no one to know it, but he could not be hidden. The deep revelation here is that Jesus simply was looking to take some time and get away by himself, probably to hear from his father and to escape from the religious leaders that wanted to kill him. Amen? That's the deep truth that's there. If you find deeper one, bless you. All right. Second in this is found in Matthew 15, 22 and Mark 7, 25 and 26. And if you're going to put a heading on this, you can call it her faith and humility in action. Now, this is where the meat of this uh, uh, message is going to start hitting home here, okay? So we got to listen closely to what the Spirit of God wants to say. Matthew 15, 22, and behold, a woman of Canaan came from the region and cried out to him saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. Mark 7, 25 and 26 says this, For a woman whose daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. This is what I see first from these two verses or from these three verses. Faith and humility seeks answers at any cost. Faith and humility seeks answers at what? Any cost. We look at this. This nameless woman has a desire for her daughter who is severely demon-possessed. So she has a mission. She's got a focus. What is it? My daughter's in trouble. I need to get her free. She finds herself in the right place at the right time. That was spurred on by the devil trying to work through religious leaders in destroying Jesus before his time. Now, you look at this, and you you see this uh, in these passages, but it says here, what? In Mark 7, 25, it says, for a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit did what? Heard about him. What did she hear? She heard the one who's delivering, healing, setting everyone free is in my neighborhood. And what does faith and humility do? I am going to truth. Faith and humility doesn't make excuses about when, the, when deliverance is in the neighborhood about why it can't go. Now, pride and fear will. They'll make excuses. Well, I can't go today. Why? Well, I got this going on. Truth is this way, isn't it? It'll really break in pieces as a hammer your plans. When truth is present and truth is available and the Lord is in the neighborhood, 
Humble faith people will find it. They won't make excuses or come up with reasons why it won't work right now. Do you see this? Now you say, you may say, well, don't go too deep here, preacher. You might start reading my mail. I guarantee you, before this is over, by the Holy Spirit of heaven, I will read your mail. You say, how? Because it just happens. I have people come up to me like, you know, who you been talking to that I know? Nobody. It's not me. I just get to be the martyr. <laughs> I just get to be the one that, that the Lord has chosen to be the voice at this point. What will truth, what will faith and humility do? They'll seek truth at any cost. Well, it's embarrassing. I have a child in this condition. Pride, fear. I love Jesus. I mean, I just, you know, I mean, that's a, that we make that statement. But I do. I mean, you think about him. He doesn't care what condition you're in. Because he's the author of fixing all conditions. <laughs> he doesn't care. It's, it, we, we have so much pride in America. We got American pride. That's a sin. Oh, <laughs> see, people don't like that. <laughs> All right? Prove it biblically. And I am tough to argue with. If we are going to receive everything the Lord has for us, or, or I'm sorry, maybe we should back this up. How many have arrived to complete Christ like perfection? <laughs> <laughs> And people will come up to me and go, in the spirit, brother. <laughs> okay, I'll give you that. In the spirit, Christ did do a, per, a complete work, but he's working. There's, you're more than just a spirit. Amen? So what does is, what is humility and faith do? It looks at truth and goes, you're right. Forgive me, Lord. See, truth and humility will go, a word will come and it, it's a hammer. Yeah, yep, yep, that's right. Yeah, look, go ahead, Lord. Go ahead and just uh, uh, get after that lie that's been attached to me in my thinking and beat that thing out of there. Now, I don't know about you, and maybe you have a special relationship with God that nobody else has, which is not true. <laughs> you don't. I'm just being sarcastic. When the Lord deals with me about things that I don't want dealt with, it hurts. Now, I'm not saying he beats me. I'm not saying he abuses me. I'm not saying he takes on the character of the devil and all of a sudden, you know, I'm headed to the grave. What I'm saying is, in every relationship, there comes a point where there's a meeting and it has a conflict. Now watch. In your marriage, it could be either of you. In your relationship with the, with the Lord, it's always you. <laughs> I don't care. It's always, I, in my relationship with the Lord, sometimes I'm like, Lord, I don't think this is fair. I'm always the one that has to change if we're going to make this relationship work. <laughs> <laughs> How many know it's always that way? Faith and humility yield to truth. They yield. Now let's watch this. Now I'm gonna, as we go through this, I'm gonna play a little game with you, okay? I'm gonna play, uh, I'm gonna respond incorrectly for the Syrophoenician woman. Now, this account is here because she responded correctly, and we're to follow that. But I'm going to take liberty 
and respond from pride and fear on some of this too to try and show you what will take place and to show you what the potential uh, outcome could have been. So we see here, she comes to the Lord. She's nameless. That's another thing. There's a lot of people today that were like, why didn't they put my name in there? I'm the one that got the miracle. It was my faith. Jesus said it was great faith. See, humility doesn't need the credit. Humility will just take the blessing and go. And let the fanfare, whatever. Come on, every, every true believer, every mature believer knows <laughs> it's just by the grace and mercy of God that I have made it this far. And I am not dead. I mean, dead from this planet. I mean, I'm totally alive inside. There's no way. I, I can't die on the inside. It's impossible. <laughs> I can almost teach on that, but we'll leave it at that. Okay. This woman lives in an area where Baal worship was ingrained and went all the way back to Jezebel. Whether she was raised ignorant of God or hated the Jewish God, she knows Baal has not helped. How many have tried things without the Lord and it never helped? I successfully ran my life into the ground by the time I was 19 years old. And it wasn't my parents' fault, it was mine. I tried everything the world told me to try. Well, I shouldn't say everything, but enough to know this is stupid. This ain't working. Amen? And I don't know if that was her case or not. What else do we see here, though? She heard about Jesus. So when you hear truth, that's where it starts. This same statement is made in the account of the woman with the issue of blood. When she heard about Jesus, what did she do? In spite of her physical condition, in spite of her ailment, in spite of her weakness, in spite of the fact that the doctor said there's nothing else we can do, in spite of the fact that she was completely broke because she had spent all her money on the doctors, she got up and started walking. How many think that was a long walk? And then she has to press through the crowd? Pride goes, it's too hard. I, uh, if the Lord really loved me, he'd send him to my house. Ooh, I'm going to hit some of these. I can't wait. It just, it, eat, it ate my lunch. The devil has fought me so hard on this message. I'm like, I had this whole message written. I was telling Josh. And I accidentally deleted it. Six pages of notes. Count it all joy, my brother. I was like, I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity <laughs> to exercise my faith. <laughs> First thing we see, and we've talked about this, humility will hear. Mike talked about this in leadership a few weeks back. Be slow to speak, be quick to what? Listen. Listen. Second, faith will be deposited when you hear. And once, and once action is put to that faith, it is just a matter of applying patience and the answer will manifest. Amen. We, we inherit the promises of God by faith and patience, right? What else do we see from these three verses? She calls him Lord and cries out for mercy. This shows what? Humility. In acknowledging his position of authority and in acknowledging that she knows she needs mercy. She is not coming in an arrogant, demanding way. There is no, I deserve this attitude. Coming to God on the basis of our good works declares that we do not understand grace or the condition of our sinfulness without Christ. I'm going to say that again. Coming to God on the basis of our good works. Lord, I bake pies for people in the church. Lord, I said hi to Pastor Mike. Lord, I, I did this. I did, you don't understand grace if you're trying to earn blessings by doing good works. You can't earn it. You can receive it. And then the works you do can only be done by grace empowering them. 
If you just do them out of your own human good, that's, just, that's exactly what Adam and Eve fell into. In the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it's human good. Well, I'll do enough to earn my position with God. You won't. You need to come and say, Lord, you are Lord. I need mercy here. And the devil will come to you and go, and he'll do this. He plays this game. He'll come to you and he'll say, remember what you did wrong this time, this time, this time, this time? And right then is our opportunity to go, I'm not receiving by my works right now. I'm receiving by his grace and the faith he's deposited within me. Thank you, Lord, I take it. I'm not receiving because I came up with the idea. I'm not receiving because I came up with this this truth that came to me. I'm receiving because of what God said about himself and his expression of love to me. And so since he chose to love me, and sometimes I wonder why he chose to love me, but the reality is he chose to love me, and if I'm going to function in humility under truth, in faith, then I have to submit and say, God, you love me enough to send Jesus for me. (laughs) I'm in because of that. That's it. That is not fair. That is favor. (laughs) That is grace. She had persistent faith, Matthew 15, 23, and Mark and and 24, Matthew 15, 23, and 24, and Mark 7, 27. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But Jesus said to her, this is Mark 7, 27, let let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and to throw it to the little dogs. We see her faith and humility continues with persistence here. She could have taken no answer from Jesus personally. What if you prayed and you're asking, you got a demon-possessed child and Jesus ignores you? She could have said, fine. You don't want to talk to me? Then I don't want to talk to you. Does that sound familiar? She could have said, I thought I heard you were a compassionate healer. But I guess you're not. You say, what are these responses? Pride. I guess you really don't care about helpless children, Jesus. Some God you are, Jesus. People are doing this right now. In the church. Again, in our relationship with the Lord, He doesn't have to make adjustments. We do. Amen? Not only do we see Jesus not responding, we see the disciples telling Jesus to send her away. That's like a double slap in the face. These are all opportunities to be what? Offended. She could have walked away right here and missed her daughter's deliverance. Do you see the consequence? She could have walked away right here and what? Missed her daughter. Her story could have ended here. She could have gone home, found her daughter still demon-possessed. Her neighbors could have come over to offer support, and she could have been sharing with them about how she went to Jesus and his disciples, and he ignored her, and his disciples asked that she be sent away. So Jesus didn't answer. And the disciples asked that she, be, her, that she be sent away. Now, to top it off, she's the wrong nationality. And the nationality she is are referred to as dogs. Now, if you came in the church this morning and the greeter said, we don't take dogs. And I said, where's your faith? In other words, at what point is the enemy able to take 
the circumstances around you or the people around you and derail your faith and your knowledge of who God is. She's the wrong nationality, and her nationality is dogs. Now, that wasn't uncommon totally in that day because anybody that wasn't a Jew was considered a dog because you're a Gentile. What is the potential for offense and pride here? Pride says, let me tell you about some Jews that I know if you think I'm a dog. Now, I have, a, I have Scottish, I have a, quite a bit of background, but my name, my last name is Scottish. And if you came to me and you said, Scottish people are dogs, I could go, well, what nationality are you? If I identify more with this rather than him, I can, my humility won't remain and my faith will cease. Well, the problem is, and we go through, in the natural world we go through, the problem is, Politics. The problem is uh, this group. It's Democrats. They're the problem. It's Republicans. They're the problem. It's, it's all the white people. They're the problem. It's all the Native American. They're the problem. It, it's a different shade of color of skin. That's the problem. Actually, the problem is sin. I've found I get along with every single color, race, whatever, gender, it doesn't, none of that matters. It's the heart of a person. And the heart of every man without Christ is sinful. Everyone. Now, in Christ, you're righteous. Humility would say, truth, Lord. This nameless woman's faith and humility continue. The reason why is she has one desire in mind. She is not here to have her nationality or social status affirmed by Jesus. She is here to get deliverance for her daughter. When you understand your purpose, it doesn't matter what's going on in the natural. In the spirit, you can press through. When you understand who's in you, when you understand who has called you, when you understand that you are eternal, that you will live forever in one place or another, heaven or hell, when you understand what Jesus has done for you and who he has made you, you can hate me because of my skin color, you can hate me because of my political stance, you can hate me and despise me and reject me for all sorts of things, but if I remain in humility and faith, I am like, I'm like the, uh, 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 have you ever seen a ping pong ball that's shoved down into a, a can of like sand or beans or something and you can shake it that ping pong ball will always come to the top I'm like a flotation device in a, in a pool I am coming to the top you can try and drown me. You can speak evil of me. You can call me what you want to call me but in the end if I yield to truth I'll have my deliverance And guess what? I don't have to fight any natural person along the way. Because my battle's not with you. See, I see past you. I see into the Spirit. You say, how? Is it an open vision? If you open to it. Well, you've, you've, you've never seen in the Spirit. <laughs> yes, I've seen in the Spirit quite a few times. That doesn't matter. That's not what I'm living on. This is what I'm living on. I know if you hate me because I'm a certain skin tone, then you have Satan working in your heart. I know, and it, that goes every direction. I also know this, that I will not fight you on that. The only thing I'll do is try and lead you to the Lord. Because I care about your deliverance. Bondage is, that's the thing about deception. It's very deceiving. <laughs> we see a great lesson in this whole account. 
we see the compassion of Jesus. She may not have realized it at the time, but Jesus was leading her down a path of faith in order to get her what she desired. He does the exact same thing with us if we submit and follow. It takes humility and faith to follow Jesus. Matthew 15, verse 28. Mark 7, verse 28. The heading for this particular portion, faith and humility agree with Jesus. And she answered and said to him, yes, Lord. And this is the title of the message. Yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. And she answered, this is Mark 7, 28. And she answered and said to him, yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. So they recorded it the same. So what do we see here? She continued in faith and humility. Humility will agree with God even if he calls you a dog. Jesus was not insulting her. This was the position all nations carried under the old covenant, outside of the Jews. In agreeing with Jesus, she put herself in a position under his authority and in a position to eat crumbs. Come on. Now, you've got to think about this because, you know, we think New Testament. We think, I'm a child. I'll eat the whole table full of food. The Lord is my sh-. He prepares a table before me in the presence. But you've got to understand where she's at. She's under an old covenant setting. She's not a proselyte Jew. She is a part of a group that worships Satan, worships Baal. Her daughter is demon-possessed. How many know whatever you worship will manifest? Yeah, there it is. It will. Well, I just follow my heritage. My heritage was this. My ancestors worshiped this. You better be careful. Because your ancestors could have worshiped a demon. That's that hammer truth again. She put herself in a position... To eat crumbs. Do you know what pride would have done? She wouldn't have eaten crumbs. Now think about the power of God. Crumbs delivered a severely demon-possessed girl. And you've got the loaf. (laughs) You've got the loaf. Again... We have to point out here that if she would have allowed her flesh and pride to respond, she would have missed crumbs. Her daughter would not have been delivered. Are you seeing the potential found in faith and humility? The opposite of this is true as well, the potential of bondage that comes through pride and fear. If the Lord says you are a dog, we say, bow wow. You say, what? I ain't no dog. (laughs) You understand my point here. The Lord is not going to call us a dog. The point is, he's right, and I need to submit. He's right, and I need to submit. If the Lord calls us a dog, we say, bow wow. Now we know that as born-again children of God, we all have a seat at the table. But the truth remains that a lack of faith and humility will hinder our ability to eat, even though we're children. Many in the church act in pride by not agreeing with who Christ has made them in grace. Many in the church are still trying to earn their freedom. Well, if I do this this way long enough, if I give enough money, if I do enough good works, if I serve enough, why are you doing this? Well, I don't want to, I, I don't want to, you know, I want to be in good graces with the Lord. You're in a good position with the Lord because of what Jesus did, not because of what you do. It is pride to identify yourself. Well, I'm going to I'm going to add to I'm going to add to this. It is ignorance and or pride. 
if what you are declaring about you doesn't line up with what God, what Jesus has made you to be as a believer. People say, well, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. You can't be both. Either you're an old sinner or you're saved by grace. Well, Paul said, I was the chief of sinners, or I am the chief of sinners. I believe it was I was. I don't believe it's a, he's saying I am. Paul was the one that wrote everything that he wrote about being in Christ. Why would he revert in one of his epistles all the way back to an old thinking? He wouldn't. It just wasn't translated correctly. Paul, and if you read it in context, you can see it. Paul wasn't saying, I'm just a sinner, I'm just a sinner, that's what I do, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner. We know we have the potential to sin because of our unrenewed flesh. We understand that, and an unrenewed mind. But you, the spirit man, you are born again. You, one third of you, I love what Andrew Womack says, is wall to wall Holy Ghost. There is not Jesus and demons camping out in your house, in your heart. Are you kidding me? Jesus is like, come on in, devils. This is my house here, but come on in. You know, we're just working together. We're hanging out. People say, well, why do I have the problems I do? Because your noodle needs renewal, and your, your body needs correction. It needs crucifixion. Agree with what the Lord said about you. Faith and humil humility produce results, and we'll stop right here. Matthew 28, uh, 15, 28, and Mark 7, 29, and 30. Matthew 15, 28 says, Then Jesus said to her, answered her, and said, O oh, woman, great is your faith. See, this is great faith. Great faith submits to truth. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed that very hour. Mark 7, 29 says this. Then he said to her, for this saying, go your way, the demon has gone out of your daughter. I don't have time to teach on this, but that looks like faith speaking right there. And verse 30 says, and when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone out and her daughter lying in bed. Glory to God. How many think that's a better outcome than demon possessed for life? When Jesus tells someone that they have great faith, we should pay attention to what they did and follow their example. I love this statement, let it be to you as you desire. This reminds me of Mark eleven twenty four. 24. Therefore I say unto you, what, so th what's, what things soever ye desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. This woman allowed her desire of a child healed to keep her on task in faith and humility until she saw re the reality of her desire. What is it that you desire from the Lord? Are you, keeping, are you allowing that vision to keep you to run your race? Pride could have derailed her faith and she could have ended up dealing with a child that was demonized her entire life. Instead, this woman experienced normal relationship with her daughter in the freedom of Christ. Don't you love that? Nor That's a Jesus outcome. That's not a man-made outcome. She experienced freedom in all of her life with her daughter able to have conversations, go where they want to go, do what they want to do, or able to, she, she was, this Syrophoenician woman was able to look at her daughter and go, Jesus is the one that saved us. They now had relationship with God. They were, they, they stepped in and ate in a covenant that they weren't even in yet. Now think about that. That'll mess with your head. She stepped into, and it could be prophetic. We know the centurion guard had his daughter delivered, right? Or his servant, as it were. We know that. He wasn't a Jew. But he stepped in. They stepped in. And what did Jesus say about both of them? Great is your faith. Why don't you stand? Thank you, Lord. 
What is it, as you're praying this week, as you ask the Lord and He shows you, what area of your life has truth come and you go, I don't know if that's it. (laughs) What area of my life, as I'm praying this week, as I'm seeking the Lord and looking at these things, Lord, what are you saying to me? Where do I need to make an adjustment? Where have I been offended at or allowed pride to lead me rather than humility and faith? Where have I allowed how someone else treated me to, to, to uh, hinder my view of you? I, <clears throat> this week as I've been just hanging out with the Lord and walking through things, and you know, how many know we fight spiritually every day and every week? And just walking through different things in my own life. The Holy Spirit, he, and the Lord was just talking to me. He said, Sean, you don't realize how much the enemy is attacking. And how subtle it is. It is very subtle. At times, the enemy, and I know you've experienced this in some way, and maybe not in the exact same way. The enemy will take a look that's on someone's face that they, when they looked at you, and they'll, he'll paint a whole picture of why that person hates you in your mind. And all they had was gas. <laughs> they were probably like, oh, I hope they don't talk to me. And the devil will go, you say, how do you know this? He tries to do this with me as a pastor with the church. I guarantee you, 15 minutes, probably less, after I'm done speaking today, the enemy's going to bring a thought to me. You really messed up that sermon. <laughs> That's what I tell him. <laughs> now, I've been, I've been preaching for years, and it's never changed. You say, well, what has changed? My response. I don't ever want to hurt anybody or offend anybody. That's not my goal. But truth is truth. We're supposed to speak it in love, but even if I say it in the nicest tones, as humans, we can all choose to be offended. And if the enemy can do that and get you thinking a certain way, how many have ever been in a situation where you had a rough you know, you, like a relationship or something in your life where it went bad, it was wrong, and maybe you were legitimately wronged. Boy, you guys are all pretty sheltered. I don't believe it. <laughs> okay? The enemy can replay that in your mind over and over and over again if you let him. And listen to me now. What will happen is nothing will happen to the person. He's just using it as a stronghold to stop you from receiving. He'll use it. He uses it as a weapon. It's a pry bar. It's a cheater bar. He uses it to pry on you, and then he'll he'll do this. If God really loved you, why did he allow that to happen? And this continual process happens. And then what happens is there's a stronghold that develops in the mind and in the thinking and in the spirit, the spirit, the spirit of Antichrist, a demon, a devil, I'm not saying you're demon possessed, attaches itself to that area. And then from there, you have this continual process of that reaming on you. And, the, and you, you, it's like you can't receive from the Lord. It's like the, the enemy has the door Katie barred shut. When the truth is, in those situations, you go, yeah, Lord, that was rough, wasn't it? That hurt me, Lord. That wasn't right what they did, but I forgive them. I know years ago, (laughs) 
there was a, some teaching that came out. And there's some truth to this, but it can get way off. And this was off. About, you know, how my parents raised me. Their fo- now, it wasn't obviously written directly to me. It was general. But all generational curses and all these things, you know, my parents, you know, they... And so what, ha- what I watched happen in the church is there was a whole bunch of people that were believers, had been believers for years, who actually developed the, the reason why they could not spiritually grow is because their parents didn't raise them perfectly. That is junk. Do you know how prideful that is? So all those kids, do you now have kids? So what are your kids going to do to you? People say, well, you saying we don't make mistakes as parents? <laughs> That's funny. That's why you're supposed to lead them to Jesus. <laughs> Not you. All right, parents. <laughs> I love this. Parents, if you have kids, I want you to say this after me. Say, I forgive myself for doing things wrong. God's not holding it against you. And pa- p- people, the kids, well, I would have I turned out different if my parents wouldn't have done this and wouldn't have done that. You're acting like you don't have individual responsibility, especially if you're an adult. Now, I'm not saying it couldn't hinder you. I'm not saying it couldn't have messed with you. But I will say this, as long as you blame somebody else for not taking your own responsibility in what you're supposed to do, you will never be free and you will peddle bondage to others. I have an answer for you. Adam and Eve screwed us all up. (laughs) And guess what? I'd have screwed it up if I was there. But Jesus made it right. Amen? Jesus made it right. Come on, say this with me. Say, I forgive me. Amen? He's a deliverer. My ability to overcome the enemy's strongholds is not in my own strength. It's in his. So I would start talking the other way. Lord, you know how much I've messed up. Like, you've heard me say this before. I've done a lot of things right with my kids. I'm still raising them. I've done things wrong, but I've told him before, you're going to know God. You'll be no excuse on whether on how to get to heaven or how to know the Lord. And when you have your own kids, you'll get your own opportunity to screw it up. And I'm not believing for that. I'm saying, I understand our nature, right? Come on. How many receive deliverance right now? 